I think that regarding AI, companies today should be more personalized with their AI that they are developing because ChatGPT is something that is really wide. But if you want to professionalize in, for example, shopping experience with AI, you must develop like a unique AI engine that will be relevant to that field. You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. I'm super excited to be uh, chatting with uh, Omar Cohen today. Uh, Omar is the CEO and founder of Skeep. And most of us don't know what Skeep is, so I want to hear the origin story for Skeep. So what was the catalyst for you deciding that uh, you wanted to launch Skeep? And then we can get into some more questions. Cool. So first, uh, thank you for hosting me. Uh, pleasure to be here. So a little bit about Skeep. So Skeep founded like three years ago uh, by me and by Daniel Nemeth, my co-founder and CDO. And actually, the main vision was that we aiming to help brands guide and navigate shoppers to the right products or to the right journey. And we want to do it with more personalized and automated interactive experiences on the whole e-commerce channel. So the main thing that we're doing today, we're building kind of an AI engine that knows how to integrate to any e-commerce store or any product catalog, scan it, analyze it, and in minutes generate another layer of interactive experiences that will enhance the product discovery, that will enhance the customer experience, and mostly will improve the whole performance on the e-commerce website. So that is especially Skip. We're working from giants, consumer brands to small D2C brands. We want to serve everyone. And we're targeting especially the e-commerce brands could be marketplaces, a D2C website, and cosmetics, fashion, personal care, food, beverage, anything. So that's about us. That, that's cool. You know, when I think about discovery, right, I think about discovery as sort of in, in two buckets. And uh, I sort of think about discovery as the the sort of fairly simple, straightforward people who bought this also bought that. And that usually tends to be like a complementary product or, you, you know, finding something that's almost identical to what you're looking at. Then there's an entirely different bucket of discovery, which is more serendipitous. It's like, yeah. wow, I didn't even know this existed or, wow, you know, th- I-, I wasn't even thinking about this. And so, you know, w- what's the role of discovery in e-commerce relating to those sort of two different types of journeys about discovery of product? So it's really an interesting question because I believe the discovery is is a wide, wide thing. So if you think about it, there is discovery for products, there is discovery for brands, discovery, uh, insight, discovery that help you to find the right journey for you. So discovery is kind of a big deal. But I think that in uh, on, on these days, customers are more and more disrupted by, by you know, a variety of, of issues. There are large marketplaces with wide product catalog. There are more and more brand on each vertical. So let's say, for ex- example, the skincare vertical. Three years, four years ago, there was only like hundred thousands of brands. Today, there are niche brands on a specific skincare area and thousands of brands on a general skincare area. So I think that as more and more competitors driving to the D2C channels, it's making the user to be more difficult to choose the right product, to choose the right brand, to understand what will be the relevant process or journey for him and actually we skip we're trying to make it easier both for the brands and both for the shopper to find the right way to shop the right product to find the right uh, journey that will be relevant to him and i think that if you think about that there are some old components or old elements on the e-commerce website like search menu filter that I'm pretty sure that not fit to these days. So we're trying to take in like the search and turn it to something more unique. We're trying to start to, to, to uh, taking the filter and to transfer it to something that is more Gen Z oriented. 
So we think that if the shopping experience will be more personalized, data-driven, engaging, it will be enhance the user to, to find the right product for him. So uh, yeah, that is like the, the discovery words can be anything. Right, absolutely. You know, I, I know obviously AI in general has been in the, the news a lot and I, I believe you guys use a generative AI. So how does that fit into the e-commerce ecosystem to have a, a generative AI in the background? Um, so the generative AI, of course, it's like a, a big trend right now. But at Skip, we, we already developed this channel like during the last five, six months. And, and I think that, that there is one word that, that enhancing the, the generative AI, which is time. Either if you're like a small D2C brand or a giant enterprise, Brands today looking for a tool that will save them time, save them time in processes, manual processes, that it will be enable them to be more focused on key topics like analytics, business decisions, A-B testing, and everything. So from our side, the generative AI will be to help them to create, generate dozens of experiences that already will be exist with content, with visual, with text, with the with, with, with their product catalog or with their e-commerce uh, description that's out there and save to the e-commerce manager, to the marketing manager, to the digital manager, tons of hours to create those experiences. Just like a, 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 some of strange fact, but to create a one quiz, recommendation quiz on an e-commerce website, it's taking 25 hours on average for any brand to create it. They are using developers, copywriters, um, you know, a lot of stakeholders that with the generative AI can save them like kind of 50 or 70% from the onboarding or the creation process. So that's how the generative AI very simply can build in and be part of the day-to-day -day of the e-commerce market. That, that's really cool because, you know, I was thinking about it, you know, from the perspective of you know, existing user data and log data being important, but sometimes the generative AI just needs to know all the various facets and reasons a product might be used or use cases and can really assist in creating a good journey out of that. So um, th that explanation was really useful. Um, yeah. On the marketing data side, right, The one of the reasons why sometimes a small to medium-sized organization or retailer or brand sort of thinks like, oh, I can't use anything AI related is because of the, the data asymmetry, right? They sort of think about it. Well, uh, I'm small. I, you know, I don't get that many orders. I don't get that much traffic. You know, an AI is not going to have enough information to make recommendations. Whereas sure, you know, uh, Sephora, right? They get statistically valid information in 10 minutes. It takes me two months to get the same amount of information on my website that they get in 10 minutes. So how do you uh, sort of advise the, the 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 user of a platform that's going to be AI, AI driven and it sort of explain like no no it, it can it can start to iterate pretty quickly when it's uh, when it's AI based. So I think um, regarding AI, so we think about it like as a huge network. So as much as we have more data on our engine, will be enable to provide our services to any size of brand. And that's why we're targeting to work with any size of brand, if we, even if it's a small brand or a large brand. The reason for that, that Skip kind of training the AI on thousands of e-commerce stores. So we have data about a small protein brand or a giant cosmetic brand. And as much as we'll, we'll be connected to more and more stores and we'll be enabled to analyze more and more end user, our service will be more professional also to serve small brands that don't have their giant databases that they can, they, that the AI should be integrate and learn like on X time. And also after that, he will be more and more efficient. No. With Skip, we're trying to build kind of a network that the AI engine will be strong enough to generate any experience that will be enough personalized, even though if you have like 10 SKUs on your e-commerce store. Right. Oh, that, that's, uh, that's cool. Um, you know, I, I sort of think about, you know, user segments a lot, right? And personas and, and, and different 
groups of shoppers that have different needs and they shop differently. You know, I mean, just even if you think about a grocery store, like some people will go to the grocery store five times a week and just shop for what they need in the next 24 to 48 hours. Other people, you know, prefer Costco and going once every two weeks and they have three freezers at home, right? So different shoppers, different needs, obviously, depending on the category, to your point about cosmetics, right? Some people have particular skin conditions or skin tones or dryness or whatever, right? So they're going to shop differently. So how do how do you deal with this idea of like different shoppers need a different shopping experience? Okay, so if you think about it, there are different or variety of users that are especially different from each other's. Let's count them. There is like the Gen Z users, which is like a very very young user that want to get very Gen Z or a cool shopping experience. There is the loyal user that already familiar with, with, with the brands and he actually know what he want to buy or we have some history with it. There is the first time user, which is a normal user, just first time going to this e-commerce website. We have the deep user or the pro user, which is more a user that want to discover and see the whole description and see the whole data. And either, and we have also kind of a curious user, which is a user that want to investigate or get some more interesting journey. The idea here is to try or enable brands to provide users with tailor-made experiences for each kind of users, that the content will be specialized for them, that the experience will be personalized to them, that the visual or the experience itself, because if I'm like a pro user and I want to get more pro experience, I should get, for example, a quiz. But if you like Gen Z user, you should get something that is more cool, relevant to social media, because it will enhance and it will increase dramatically the percentage that you will actually will be engaged or purchase one of those products with this brand. So that's how the, the difference between each user or shoppers insert to the generative AI discovery to one to actually one unit. That's cool. And and obviously marketers are extremely KPI driven, right? They 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 want to, they're driven off of average order value, lifetime customer value, conversion rate, you know. And so do you have any stories or, or case studies? You can leave the brand names out if you have to for privacy purposes, but well, like fun stories about where you layered in uh this kind of customized, personalized shopping experience and it made a big difference in more and more of the KPIs. So actually, it's also a great question, and, and I, will, I will tell you why. When I'm pitching to brands, the brands kind of uh, ask me, what is the, what are, are, are the main KPIs that your solution help us? Is it conversion? Is it data collection? Is it AOV? Is it engagement? And it's really funny to see that each brand, it's actually different. You can see like a brand that his main value will arrive from email captures. And other brand that his main value will arrive from conversion uplift. And other brand that his engagement on the website will be much better with four different quizzes. So I think that what Skip trying to do is we have kind of a layer, a fan of different parameters that we can help the brands. But each brand's as the user should be personalized. So also the performance or the parameters will be very personalized on the upgrade, uplift on any size of that. So yeah, that's about it. Yeah, well, that's that's great great to explain because uh, it, it, it may solve problems uh, very differently for different brands. So they should, you know, they should obviously um, at least ch check out who, yeah, which ones yeah. that, that it might move the needle on uh, based on what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Um, you know, anytime there are any uh, platforms that use user data to make better decisions in personalizing experiences, et cetera, people always get worried about uh, the, the focus on privacy and, and uh, some regulators are particularly in the EU are extremely hyper-focused on privacy uh, does Keep work the same way in the EU as it does in the US and elsewhere, or does it work differently? So actually, right now, it's work pretty the same. We are adapted to the like the regulation and privacy on both uh, countries. But it's also a good point because I'm not sure if you are familiar with the with the term zero party data. 
structure. So zero party data is actually a data that the end user is willing to give to the brands. So it's kind of skip the whole privacy and regulation performance. Why is that? Because if I will insert or implement some interactive engagement like quizzes or other discoveries that will enable the brands to interact very fast with the brands, we'll see huge increasing in zero party data collection. So instead you will have like one, two pop-ups that the end user will insert an email. You will have dozens of touch points, zero party data touch points that will enable the end user to interact with the brand to learn or educate much more or much better. And from the other side to the brand, collect both first and zero party data that is much stronger and faster and larger from other tools. So the zero party data is kind of a very important and unique thing in our uh, core platform. Cool, cool. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, I think you and or your team were at the uh, National Retail Federation, the NRF show in New York City recently. Um, you know, it's it's been a while since they had a show of that magnitude, obviously due to the pandemic. So I'm curious if you got a certain vibe or a certain takeaway from that that event. Um, our events back, was there sort of a completely different vibe? Was it sort of back to the, the past? Was it back to the future? Like, what what was your takeaway from that? First of all, it was wonderful because it's like, I think it's the first year after two or three years after COVID that there was like thousands of thousands of people. Everyone was like, we're really happy. So it was it was a good thing. Um, I think that we, we saw um, um, very interesting trends that, that out there. First is, of course, the AI. You can see more and more uh, it can be enterprise software to startups that are trying to implement on their products and AI. It can be a chat GPT, but it can be also like a core AI. I think that regarding AI, companies today should be more personalized with their AI that they are developing because chat GPT is something that is really wide. But if you want to professional in, for example, shopping experience with AI, you must develop like a unique AI engine that will be relevant to that field. More than that, we see two more really cool trends. We saw the hyper-personalization, which is again, taking each of parameters on the e-commerce or the retail aspect and trying to personalize to the right user. Even though if it's like an offline journey, an online journey, an omni-channel journey, whatever it is, the hyper-personalization is kind of the next step. And the last thing is data. So zero-party data, first-party data, some data sources that tools or software provides brands to collect more and more data to enhance the hyper-personalization uh, and other journeys that will be more personalized. Um, so yeah, that's about cool. the NRF. Well, it's 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 uh, great that the NRF uh, big show seems to be back. I couldn't make it this year, um, but I'm going to be certainly putting on my calendar for next year. Um, yeah, yeah. What, what has your are you excited about 2023, um, either professionally or just within the industry? Uh, yeah, so actually 2023 from our side, it's really uh, exciting. First of all, we launching officially our our Shopify platform. And more than that, we're starting like uh, kind of um, pilot and, and some big project with enterprises. So as I said, keep trying to serve any size of company. We just launched uh, three months, four months ago, our, our beta version of the AI. And now the AI engine is really cool. So in kind of one month from now, you will be able to go to the Skip.io website and you will see a generator that will give you kind of a teaser, what are the abilities and uh, performance of Skip with the AI. So you will insert kind of a random URL of an e-com store and it will generate for you like in 20 sec different kind of experiences, quizzes or swipers or some other tools that will help the end user to find the right product or, ter or turn the whole shopping experience to something that is more cool. So from our side, 2023 will be excited here um and yeah we are we are absolutely waiting for that cool cool well, uh, i'll be looking forward to watching your progress uh through the year and uh 
perhaps tr taking the technology for a spin at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We looked into. Sounds good. Thanks. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street. If Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe or follow.